Sometimes you're going to get something that looks like this, and it's going to be really, really hard for you to get k sub d off of that. Okay? Um, it's difficult to obtain visually without probably a really large amount of uncertainty. Okay? And so, so what you want to do is manipulate your equation and put it in a log-log relationship so that you can more easily get k sub d off of your graph. By using the logarithm, the low concentrations of ligand get stretched out, allowing for a more accurate fit of your data. Any deviation from linearity, so before we had a hyperbolic relationship that we were looking for, now if we have any deviation from linearity on our log-log plot, that will be our indication of more complex binding or of allosteric. Okay. Down here, so why do you think these error bars are increasing? Because we have our lower and lower concentrations of ligand, where we don't have error bars on our samples on the our higher samples. Any ideas? Low concentrations are error prone due to the limitations of detecting a weak signal whether it be fluorescence, whether it be radioactivity. We have a very small amount of estrogen actually binding when we're doing our really low concentrations at the beginning. So those signal we're measuring, remember we're measuring that radioactivity or fluorescence signal, and it's just more likely that it will be error from when it's a smaller, a smaller amount. Looking at time, and I'm trying to decide what I had planned next is we walk through the proof of this relationship. It's not, it's not complicated. I, I, we have time. Um, I was going to say just, just use it, but we can go through it. All right. going to do is essentially we're going to derive the equation for our improved log log plot to find our dissociation constant, right? It's basically we collected a binding curve using the assays we just described, but we're going to do some transformations on our data to put them into this format so that we can more easily read our value of KD. So we already gave a relationship for fractional saturation it's equal to the concentration of free ligand over the concentration of free ligand plus k sub d. And of course, when these two things are equal, it's half saturation. So then we can also write a relationship for 1 minus our fractional saturation. This is going to be equal to... Um, 1 minus concentration of um, And then I'm going to go ahead and just let this equal. I'm going to get a uniform denominator. This will be equal to concentration of L plus K sub D minus, why do I keep writing E? Minus L. All over free ligands plus. So these are, of course, gone. And it now looks like so 1 minus F is K sub D over uh, plus dissociation constant. Yep. So if I want to determine a ratio of bound to unbound, okay. so I want what fraction is bound up over which fraction is not. So this is our fraction saturation equation here. And then rather than actually dividing, I will just multiply by the inverse of this. These are going to drop. 
I'm going to take the log of both sides. And what I will have is the log of fractional occupancy over 1 minus fractional occupancy is equal to the log of the free ligand concentration over my dissociation constant, which can be rewritten based on properties of logs. And so now what I have is the form y equals x minus an intercept. I have a linear, linear relationship, which is what, what I was going for. And when the log of my concentration of my free ligand is equal to the log of k sub d, this side will be zero, so this side will be zero. So we can, um, I'll go back to the plot in a second and we'll see that KD is now where this linear line is crossing the zero axis, okay? So we know that where our fractional occupancy is equal to one minus our fractional occupancy is the point of 50% binding. So f over 1 minus f would be equal to 1. The log of 1 would be equal to 0. And now this is where l equals k sub d. So I'll give you a second to copy, and then we'll go back to the plot, and we'll look at where k sub d is on our new linearized uh, binding curve. Okay. So we now have a plot. We're plotting here's our y axis is the log of our fractional occupancy over one minus our fractional occupancy. The log of our x axis is the log of our free ligand concentration. So when this line crosses the zero point, is where our case of B concentration is. So if you see this plot, now you hopefully understand the manipulations that were done to the data, and you can now read where case of D is as opposed to when you're looking at the hyperbolic plot. So up until this point, I still can't stop. We have to go. Just, just you guys can do it. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm gonna break, but we can't do it. Okay, so all the way up until this point, we also, not only were we controlling ligand concentration, but we also knew our starting protein concentration, right? We were measuring how much protein was getting bound up by the ligand, but we assumed that we knew how much protein we started with. So in the estrogen receptor example, we still had a solution of estrogen receptor of some known amount. We still knew what was in this bag in our equilibrium dialysis. And oftentimes you don't have that information. You're isolating proteins directly from a cell, you're breaking apart a whole cell, and you're pulling out everything that's inside. So there's a whole bunch of proteins you don't care about, there's a whole bunch of other non-specific interactions that might happen. And so what we're gonna talk about now is something called scattered analysis. And a scattered analysis or a scattered plot its function is to basically put everything in terms of just the free ligand concentration so that you can get a dissociation constant, a case of D, without knowing how much protein you started with to begin with. All you have that you control is ligand, and you can get all the information you need from that alone. 